Al yeah. decided to travel to just as far north as you can get in this country. He is in what used to be Barrow, Alaska. It's kind of the epicenter of climate change. Yeah. You can get a good feel of what's going on. Yuki Yukiavik. Yukiavik? Yuki Utkiavik. Yuki Utkiavik. Formerly known as Barrow. You, okay, you still call it bear. It's just a lot easier. But Al, what is going on up there? I see you can even draw a crowd up there. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so these are some nice folks here, the, and that's the whalebone arch uh, of that's uh, here in Utkiavik. But I, I'll, I'll tell you what's fascinating is that uh, uh, these folks, you know, we've talked about climate change. The temperature is warming twice as fast here in Alaska as it is around the rest of the world. And so uh, what's interesting is when it comes to climate change, this is ground zero. It's the top of the world, and for scientists, Utkiavik, Alaska, formerly known as Barrow, is ground zero for climate change. What we're seeing now is unprecedented. I mean, the changes are, that are happening are happening in just 30, 50 years. So we made the trip 330 miles above the Arctic Circle. Here we are. And out onto the ice to see the research firsthand. How deep do you want it to be? 25 meters. There you go. Mm. Nice. We'll measure how thick the ice is. Uh -huh. Ignatius Rigger is a scientist from the University of Washington. <laughs> so what's this one? This is one of our fundamental weather stations. It measures air pressure, air temperatures. So the other thing this thing measures is also winds and sea level pressure. These are the fundamental parameters we need to forecast weather and study climate change. Let's go talk about your instruments. The data like Ignatius is bringing us here is absolutely critical. It helps make our weather forecasting better. Amy Holman with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, says that forecasting is the key to many Alaskans' way of life as temperatures here continue to rise at an unprecedented rate. Is this data part of that? Will this go into that to help with, with, with modeling? Weather models are so important up here, not only for knowing what it's gonna be like for how we could dress today, but also because we use our forecast for aviation, for marine transportation, and that's critical in Alaska because so many of the communities aren't on, aren't on roads. We're going to go and get the buoy. We joined scientist Victoria Hill from Old Dominion University as she deployed a buoy to measure how sunlight and heat impact the ice. Then feed it in. Victoria, the last thing to go in is the buoy. This is the brains of everything. Yes. So this is what controls switching the sensors on and off once an hour to give us data. You don't name them, do you? Um, I named the first couple, but this one's just number nine. Number nine. But we can name it after you if you want. Oh. We'll the Al Roker buoy. It'll be the Al Roker, Al yeah. in the Arctic buoy. Go, be fruitful, bring much data. Yes. Mwah. But scientists aren't just interested in the ice. Mark Ivey with the Department of Energy launches weather balloons to collect data from the atmosphere. All right, here we go. One. And right now, it's sending what back? Sending temperature. Uh -huh. um, it derives winds from GPS, wind speed and direction, and then uh, relative humidity. Very cool. Never did one of those before. Great. <laughs> and we're very interested in how these, in understanding the science basis for how changes going on in the surface and the ocean are affecting the changes um, in things like temperature and, and clouds too. Mm -hmm. So these are the data coming down from the sun you just launched. Uh -huh. We're getting a report every second. You see it rolling in. Because this, we're seeing this change here on the north slope twice as fast as other places, does that put a strain and a stress on what's happening modeling-wise for, for, for every place else? What happens up here doesn't stay up here. It's got a lot to do with weather in New York City, right? So we need to improve observations at these critical places in the world to get the models right for everybody. 
So, so guys, you know, and, and Dylan, I know you're you're probably kind of geeking out on this. Uh, <laughs> it it really does it really does have this impact. Even though you know they say, okay, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects everything from modeling for forecast and accuracy to to the fact that that we're seeing more rapid intensification of hurricanes because there's more open ocean out there because the sea ice has retreated by over 60 percent. So that. That's, that that makes a, a big deal and I but I will say that here we got a bonus this morning uh, take a look at this video the Aurora Borealis the northern lights again Dylan I was thinking about you because this was Mother Nature's light show at its finest. I, I've, I've, I've seen them once before when I was a, uh, a sophomore in, high, in uh, college uh, in upstate New York, but this was one heck of a light show, guys. Hey, Al, you had me at drops at Radio Sun, but the fact that you also got the Aurora Borealis is just one of my dreams. But on, on a serious note, you know, the, the people who live in the area where you're at, I mean, the woman in your spot, the scientist even said it herself, that they don't use roads. Everything's kind of on the ice. So what happens if that ice continues to disappear? Well, their, their, their way of life starts to disappear. And in fact, we're going to have more on that tomorrow. But, but one of the things that's, that's happened is, is that they, we're, they're getting ready for their whale hunting season. Well, normally they would get out on the ice and, and get out there to, to do that. Well, because the ice is so thin, it's probably a third to a quarter of what it should be. They can't use the normal ways that they would use to get out there safely. And so they're taking greater risks to get out there to do that. So it's mm. it's uh, it, it really does change. And in fact, tomorrow you'll see the permafrost, the ground that is frozen is thawing. And that's even changed a, their way of life because they dig cellars in their homes that basically act, am I correct, as your, your freezers in a way wow. to keep your food, the, 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 the whale meat that they've hunted. Well, because those are thawing, people are getting water into that. They can't use that. It's, wow. it's this trickle effect and for a lot of these folks, they may become the first climate change refugees because they're seeing for the first time, because there's a lack of sea ice, they're seeing beach erosion, they're seeing land erosion because they're getting storm surge. Mm. And that means they have to move out of their villages. There's a thousand miles of coastline here in Alaska, and it's all being affected by climate change. All right, Al Roker there, yeah. top of the world. We'll come back to you uh, tomorrow, my friend. Be safe up there. Uh, and tomorrow, Al's going to...